Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 27 of the Tick Bootcamp podcast. The title of today's interview is Model for Recovery, an interview with Melissa Layback. My name is Richard Johannesson. And I'm Matt Sabatello. Melissa Layback is an education marketing professional, certified nutritionist, spokeswoman, and model from North Carolina. Originally from New England, Ms. Layback moved to California to pursue her modeling career. As Ms. Layback's modeling career began to flourish, both she and her husband began to grow sick. Eventually, their illnesses progressed to the point where they had to move close to family in North Carolina. Melissa Layback's healing journey took a positive turn when she was diagnosed with Lyme disease by Dr. Weston Sanders, aka Dr. Wiggy, of the Robin Hood Integrative Health in North Carolina. Utilizing holistic alternative therapies such as ozone therapy, the primal paleo diet, herbal supplements, and EMDR therapy, she began to regain her health. Inspired by her personal battle with Lyme disease, she began to share her healing journey through blogging and Instagram. In her blog entitled The Path to Healing Chronic Neurological Lyme Disease, she shares the 10 steps she took to heal from Lyme disease. Welcome, Melissa LeBac, to our program. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me on the show. Let's talk a little bit about your life growing up in New England and ultimately the journey that took you to North Carolina. Basically, I was always kind of like a healthy, active kid. I did competitive dancing, cheerleading throughout high school. I've moved around a lot. So I, at one point, I was actually living in Hoboken, New Jersey, working in New York City. That's probably around the time that I started to have like food allergies and candida symptoms. It wasn't too bad, though. It didn't completely knock me out. I moved to Pennsylvania, and then I actually moved to San Diego, and I was in San Diego for three years. While I was in San Diego, that's when I got really, really sick with Lyme, even though I didn't know that I had Lyme at the time. And then during the third year that I lived in San Diego, my husband and I moved to North Carolina, because that's where he's from, and we were both really sick at the time, so it it was a good idea to move back to be around family. So that's kind of how I made it to North Carolina. Let's walk back to your childhood. Tell us a little bit about what your goals were when you were growing up. So I would say that, okay, so my grandfather used to describe me as a a firecracker. So (laughs) I've always kind of been like very active, very passionate, getting things done, just like just very enthusiastic about life. Uh, When I was little, I used to like build obstacle courses and like run around in them. So I was just like a very active child. I loved swimming and dancing and things like that. So yeah, basically like when I went to um, college, I went to Framingham State University. I studied fashion, design and retailing. I wanted to be a buyer and my goals changed a little bit because I ended up modeling. So I started modeling and then my goal changed to be a full-time model. So that's when my husband and I moved to California because the market was better for me there. So, you know, I've always been passionate about working out, being healthy, taking care of my skin, drinking lots of water. So I've always been like a very like holistic, very passionate about health, exercise and fitness and, you know, taking care of the body. So yeah, that's a little bit about my background. So your life in California and your full-time modeling was interfered with symptoms that began to develop? Yeah. So around the time that I was living in San Diego, I started to develop probably in the second year that I was living there. I started to develop some kind of like mysterious symptoms. But before that, I was working out every single day. I worked out sometimes twice a day. I traveled all over the world, booking jobs. And I traveled around the United States. I was a spokesmodel for many different brands. I mean, and I, I basically was like living the dream. You know, my husband and I were living in San Diego. We were like an amazing city to live in. We had tons of friends, very social. I used to go out all the time, go to parties, dancing and things like that. But I mean, everything was interrupted by Lyme. At the time I didn't know it was Lyme, but when I got really, really sick, it basically just like, I couldn't work anymore. Like at that point, like I had booked a few really big jobs and I like struggled to get through them. But the thing about Lyme is like, it's kind of crazy. Like you don't look sick. So I was able to do these jobs, even though like I was deathly ill. But at one point I was like, I I can't go on any longer. This is like, I can't fake it anymore, you know? 
one of the worst things about Lyme, I think, is that it's known as an invisible illness. So you feel like you're dying on the inside, but yet you look fine to the world, right? Right, exactly. It's horrible. Listen, can I ask you one quick question before Matt goes on? Is your husband also sick from Lyme? Yes, he actually never received an official diagnosis. And he we didn't do that because the DNA connections test was really expensive. It's, it's over $600. So my doctor was like, you know, usually married couples have it. It's not proven that it's sexually transmitted but they think that it is so we're thinking that like we both had it so he was treated for Lyme as well he was never as sick as I was but he did have a lot of severe issues with like food allergies and the adrenal glands and things like that well, so we know there's at least one study that suggests Lyme disease may be sexually transmitted because they found that in both vaginal secretions and in sperm, there would be Lyme spirochetes. But there are folks like Dr. Fallon at Columbia University who have taken the position that although many couples are both suffering from Lyme, it's a consequence of living in tick endemic communities and they were both bitten by ticks. So it may be one or the other, but I think one of the things that we have to explore is whether or not Lyme is sexually transmitted. I agree. And what's very interesting is my husband actually was bit by a tick back in 2012. He actually ended up saving the tick and we found it years later. But by that time, I don't think that we could test it. So we really don't know. Like, I don't remember getting bit by a tick. He got bit by that tick, but we don't know if that had, you know, Lyme disease, bacteria. His mother actually has Lyme disease as well. So it's just really interesting to see it run in families like that. It kind of begs the question where it's like, is is it, <laughs> you know, can you get it from contact? Now, Melissa, despite being super healthy, eating a very good diet and exercising and modeling and being very happy, you started getting sick in your early 20s. Can you walk us through your first symptoms? I kind of separate it, right? So like I would say my post-traumatic downward spiral, my symptoms leading up to that moment would be food allergies, tinnitus, chronic fatigue. Sometimes I would have like dizziness attributed to low blood pressure and muscle weakness. And you never had food allergies prior to this, right? Nope. So when I started to get really, really sick, a few months before the worst of it, I would say that like I started getting like these shooting pains that would go through my spine and it would almost feel like a tingling sensation and it would kind of do like a shoot and then I would feel it in the back of my head and it was kind of like, you know, I was like, what the heck was that? I would try to like not dwell on symptoms and things like that. Oh, it's fine. It'll go away. So that started to get worse. Then I started having like the tingling in my feet and my hands, tingling at the top of my head. I started having like these mini seizures. That was pretty scary. There's just so many things that happen now that I'm like, oh gosh. Oh, one thing that really was awful was I would say this was a turning point of the downfall that I had is I had brain fog so bad that I felt like I was in a tunnel. Like I felt like I had tunnel vision and it was almost like I couldn't communicate with anybody. And I was walking around and all of my friends were like, what the heck is wrong with Melissa? Like that she's not acting normal. Like I was almost like I, I couldn't communicate. I was like not talking to anybody, but it was because like I had this intense brain fog. Like I had so much brain inflammation that I couldn't even like put together sentences or words. So it was almost like I was walking around like trapped in my own body, if that makes sense. I started to kind of like develop chemical sensitivities. Then what really was the worst part for me was probably like the OCD that sprang up. And I say that it's pure O because I had intrusive thoughts. So I would just have like these like horrible intrusive thoughts that started happening. And I have no no history of mental health illness. So this just kind of like came out of nowhere. I had no idea what was wrong with me. I thought I was going crazy. I later found out that I had tick-borne encephalitis. And then from the whole experience, I had PTSD. Melissa, tick-borne encephalitis is swelling of the brain, right? Yeah. Now, throughout this period where your symptoms progressed from your early 20s up until 26 when you had that crash, were you seeing any doctors to see what was going on with you? I had been back and forth to a couple of holistic doctors. You know, they gave me some herbal remedies for mostly the candida. I started taking like some magnesium for my muscle weakness. 
but the muscle weakness wasn't that bad until the crash. So I didn't like take it consistently. But I would say that one doctor in particular, I went to see after the crash. And that was a referral by one of my very, very good friends in San Diego. And she, she told me because I told her about like the OCD, like the intrusive thought and the light sensitivity. And she was like, she's like, you need to go see this doctor. His name is Dr. Winkler. And all my doctors have these like funny names. <laughs> and so I went to see Dr. Winkler and I literally say that he saved my life because he was the one that looked, he took one look at me and he said, are you like, do you have weird thoughts? Like, you know, what, what's going on in your brain? And I told him, you know, I was embarrassed at the time because I was like, I didn't know it was wrong. I thought I was going crazy. Literally, I thought I was going crazy. And so he was just like, he's like, we need to do this test, this test, this test. He was a functional medicine doctor. So he did um, lots of urine tests. He did a test for mold. And that's when he found mold. So I didn't know that I was exposed to mold. So he picked up on that. And then we later figured out that my first condo in San Diego, we had mold due to poor ventilation. And I cleaned it up without a mask. And so that's probably how I inhaled all the mold. And so it was really sick with mold. And so he's the one who helped me. Um, by the time I got to Dr. Winkler, my adrenal glands were only operating at 20%. I could barely eat anything because, you know, it would make me nauseous or like I would have like a, a reaction to it. My reactions to food were really, really, really bad. Um, they would almost like trigger seizures. Melissa, so you were, you were sick for eight years from the time you were 21 to 29 before you eventually got your Lyme diagnosis. And during this time, some of your doctors, your primary care physician suggested that it was mental health and anxiety and depression and tried to push drugs like Xanax on you. Were you receptive to that? Or did you keep pushing to say, this is not what's wrong with me, there's something else and you have to help me figure out what it is? I have always been against the pharmaceutical industry. <laughs> so I was like, there is no way that this is just anxiety. I was like, I feel like my body's getting electrocuted. I'm having seizures. You know, there's tingling in my head. I have like chronic neck pain. I was like, this, this is no, this is not just like, hey, you have anxiety, take a Xana. So when they told me that, I was like, absolutely not. I'm not taking that. This is ridiculous. It's just a Band-Aid. And I resorted to functional medicine and holistic medicine. And we, we have found from a lot of our previous guests that functional doctors generally seem to be the ones who are diagnosing and treating Lyme disease because they're more aware of it. So what type of test did they use to actually diagnose you with Lyme disease? So I didn't find out that I had Lyme disease until I moved to North Carolina. Actually, I have a really interesting story. Do you want me to tell you how I actually found out that I had Lyme? Absolutely. Okay, so I went to see this holistic doctor in Santa Monica, and this was a week before I moved to North Carolina. So, I mean, I was in really, really bad shape. And my husband at the time, he was like, he was like, I don't even know if we should go see this doctor. Like, is like, can she even do anything at this point? Because it's so bad. And, you know, we're moving like, and by the way, we were like, almost like out of financial <laughs> funds, because we had spent all of our money on like holistic health care and stuff like that, because it's not covered by insurance. And I could barely work. So we were like, really hurting. So we went to see this doctor. And she actually she uses this German biofeedback device. And it's called the cyber scan. So I had tried everything at this point and I was like I'm gonna do the cyber scan and and kind of like figure out if I'm just make sure I'm not crazy and see if the, what this thing says. So basically what the cyber scan does is it's a machine that identifies different frequencies in the body and it focuses on weaknesses. So it reads your frequencies and then it compares them to this huge database of over like 100,000 different documented frequencies. So then the doctor, she's able to read through this. And so this is really new technology. And I feel like a lot of people in the United States would just think that this was like woo woo stuff, but it's backed by German physicians. So oddly enough, the machine picked up that I had epilepsy, that I had these problems with tingling and it categorizes them. So it categorized it under like Parkinson's. So, and she was like, you know, your eyes are like flickering, like you're having a lot of twitching. And then, so <laughs> it was really strange because she was reading through the results pretty quickly because she was trying to get to everything. It actually said that I had a tick that was causing encephalitis. 
and she read it and I was like, I didn't even know what encephalitis was at the time. And she was like, tick bite causing encephalitis. And she targeted it to Asia. And so we both kind of were like, hmm, that's kind of weird because we were so focused on all of the other symptoms that I had that we didn't even make the Lyme connection. So then later when I was all like settled in North Carolina and I was like, oh my God, I, I was like, I think that I have Lyme. I think I have Lyme disease. And I called that same doctor and I asked her to go back and review you the test and she called me back and she was like you're right like it, it actually is Lyme disease and I was like okay I'm gonna I'm gonna go see a Lyme doctor and confirm this so th at that point I went to see Dr. Wiggy in North Carolina and he wanted me to do the DNA connections test and so I used that to confirm that I had Lyme and sure enough, I tested positive for five different co-infections including Lyme bacteria. So, Melissa, Dr. Wiggy is Dr. Weston Sanders? Yeah. The PCR test that you got done from DNA Connections was a urine test. And what we find interesting here at Tick Boot Camp is that we weren't aware of it until the previous guests had used it as well. And out of all the states in America, New York is not allowed to use this test. There's a big banner saying to contact the governor of New York to push for this test to be permitted here. So I just think it's very interesting that it seems to be a very popular, successful test for diagnosing Lyme and other tick diseases, yet it's not available here in New York. Yeah, that, I mean, that's really odd to me that it would not be, you know, a test that every doctor should be using because in particular, like the Western blot is not good for diagnosing Lyme if it's in the late stages because your body is not responding. It's, you've had Lyme so long that your body's not creating antibodies. For the Lyme bacteria anymore. So that's what the Western blot tests for. The DNA connections test, it's a um, DNA test. So it tests your urine. And if you have that bacteria, Lyme bacteria in your body, I mean, that's a pretty good way of figuring out that you do in fact have that. Melissa, one other thing I'd like to back up to is the cyber scan test, the biofeedback. What was that like on your end for the testing? It's obviously not a blood test. What do they actually do to you to run this test? You, this sounds kind of like woo woo. And I, I know it sounds kind of funny, but it, I mean, this thing actually works. So you put your hand on this device and it basically reads the frequencies of your body. And I mean, what's interesting about it is both my husband and I did it and we had d totally different outcomes. I had a, actually a friend that referred me to this doctor that uses this machine and he was like, it knows everything. It picks up on everything. So you can use a cyber scan to kind of like test and see if it picks up on the frequencies. And then like I did, I actually went and got a DNA test for Lyme. So the cyber scan told me that I had Lyme. And then to verify it, I actually went and got the test and it was crap. And you're not the first guest to use this type of test, the biofeedback test. We had another guest who had shared her experience as well and had major success with the diagnosis and treatment as a result of that. So that's something that I think is really worth looking into for our listeners. Absolutely. Yeah, it's kind of funny, like some people are super on board with it. Other people look at me like, okay, <laughs> but hey, it works for me. And if it works for her, then I think it's something that's worth looking into. Now that Dr. Wiggy, and I love calling him Dr. Wiggy, I just love that name. Dr. Wiggy, <laughs> what was your treatment plan? He wanted me to do ozone therapy and it was very expensive for me at the time because like I said, I hadn't really been working that much. I was contracting a bit, but I wasn't working full time. So it was like really difficult for me to, you know, pay for all of this like expensive IV therapy. So we started with diet and herbal supplements. And we did that for a while. They gave me a specific herb for Babesia because that's treated differently than Lyme bacteria. He would blood test me every three months to see where my vitamins were at. At the time, I had really low vitamin D. Yeah, so we just, we basically did vitamins and herbal supplementation. We worked on remineralization, which was taking magnesium and MSM, which your body really needs for detoxification. And then I would say about six months of that, of herbal remedies, we started ozone therapy. So I actually started with, I bought an ozone brick 
myself and I started doing rectal insufflation, which is similar to an enema. So you administer the ozone rectally and that seemed to work for me pretty well. And then I wanted to kind of like speed things up. So that's when I did the major auto hemotherapy. That is basically they withdraw your blood and then they pump it with ozone and then they run it through UVB light and then they run it back into your body. Melissa, one of the things we learned from you this morning offline is that not all ozone therapy is the same. Yeah, I would say that you can use ozone in the body in multiple different ways, and there's different types of ways to do it. So like I said, you can do the rectal insufflation, you can administer into your sinuses, your ears, there's different ways of doing the blood way. So you could do a 10 pass where the blood is passed through the ozone machine 10 times, or you can start small with just like a one pass, so they only pass at one. So what I did was I started with a one pass. Then I went up to a three pass, a four pass, and then a five pass. So I've been sticking with the five pass because it works really, really well. And some doctors think that a five pass is equivalent to a 10 pass if you use the UVB light because that helps to kill viruses and bacteria in the blood. So I did 25 weeks straight of ozone major auto chemotherapy. And that worked for me really, really well. My husband did it as well. My husband hasn't had to go back and get ozone, but I still continue to get it every two weeks because it keeps my immune system functioning properly. The ozone actually is a gas that gets infused with the blood and then gets reinserted back into your vein, into your body. And then the ozone gets converted to oxygen, which helps purify your blood. Is that a a good summary of what the ozone treatment does? Yes. Yeah, it it increases the amount of oxygen in the body. So it improves circulation, oxygen supply, it kills viruses and bacteria and fungus. It helps to detoxify the liver and it boosts your immune system. So the reason why Dr. Wiggy loves using ozone is because it boosts the immune system so that your body can then fight off the Lyme by itself. I didn't want to do antibiotics because when I found out that I had Lyme, I was so late stage that it it wasn't going to be as effective. So antibiotics are perfect. If you just got bit by a tick and you know that you have Lyme, it's amazing. You do your antibiotics. But if you're if you have chronic Lyme and you've had it for a while, ozone is awesome. It's a great alternative therapy because it boosts your immune system without running your body down. So if I was to slap antibiotics on me at that time, it probably would have run me ragged and then my immune system wouldn't have been functioning. So that's why I like ozone therapy. Remineralization is something that I'm familiar with with teeth. So can you talk about how it helped you recover? Basically, when someone's chronically ill with Lyme disease or any other chronic illness, a lot of the times their body is lacking in minerals and nutrients. A lot of the times it's actually maybe the parasites or the bacteria that are eating up all of those minerals that your body needs. So a lot of people are low in magnesium and magnesium can cause like a lot of issues in the body. So magnesium is a cofactor in over 300 enzyme systems that regulate all of the biochemical reactions in your body. So what you want to do is you want to take magnesium every single day. The brand that I use is Remag. That is a magnesium that was invented by a doctor that wrote the Magnesium Miracle. She actually lives in North Carolina too. So that's a really good magnesium to take. Basically, like your body needs minerals to detoxify. You want to, you know, make sure you're taking magnesium. MSM is really a really great one to help detoxify. Taking a fulvic mineral blend is awesome too. I have a lot of these different supplements on my blog, some of the stuff that really helped me. Melissa, another thing that we noticed was you noted that you had PTSD from all your symptoms and from Lyme disease, and you used EMDR as a way to treat the PTSD, which has an 80% success rate. Can you talk more about EMDR, what it is, and how it helped you? EMDR is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. So it's a psychotherapy that helps people deal with symptoms from trauma. So I had a lot of trauma from all the experiences I had with Lyme. 
it, it kind of just like kept recycling through my brain, like all of the things that had gone on. So basically what you do is it's a little bit hard to explain. Um, you sit with the therapist and they use like a, some sort of stimulation to do the rapid eye movement. So something about rapid eye movement helps to reprocess trauma. A really good book that explains this is The Body Keeps the Score. It's a really, really great book that talks about trauma. So you sit with the therapist and she uses either, or he or she, <laughs> I say she because my therapist is a woman. She uses either like a vibrating device that, so you hold it in both hands and it vibrates back and forth. And so she can speed it up or slow it down depending on like how you're processing things. So you hold that and then she walks you through the traumatic memory. So she tries to like start you with a trigger. So she'll say, you know, like from my experience, I was afraid of driving cars because when I was driving a car, I had, you know, uh, it felt like someone was stabbing the back of my head. And it was like so painful while I was driving that I thought I was going to crash. So I had a phobia or fear of driving cars. So she would sit there and she would say, can you go back to the initial trigger? And so you would think about that trigger and then she would turn the, the vibrating device on. You can also do this without the vibrating device. The therapist can use their fingers so you can watch their finger and they can move it back and forth. I wish you could see my hand because I'm Italian. So I like to talk with my hands, but she takes two fingers and you follow it with your eye. I couldn't do that one because of my epilepsy. You can also tap the shoulders. So every time you're reprocessing through a memory, you want to just make sure that you're either tapping or vibrating. And then that helps to process through those traumatic experiences. So Melissa, you had an emotional injury as a consequence of your experiences with Lyme. Could you share with our listeners how you had to manage your emotional injuries at the same time while you were dealing with the physical complications associated with your Lyme and co-infections? So I would say that for the emotional aspect, what I, I take like a different approach than most. I never believed in taking medicine to control like your emotions. What I did was I focused on doing yoga, deep breathing, meditation. What I did was, you know, the EDMR, I worked with my therapist to kind of move past like those traumas. I also really focused on gratitude journaling. And that may not sound like a big deal, but that was one of the biggest things that helped me heal was keeping a journal. So every day I would write three things that I was grateful for. And then I would write out three affirmations, three positive affirmations. Sometimes it was more than three. So I would literally say every single day to myself, I'm healing. If you say that to yourself, you start to believe it. So that's something that like I tell everybody to do, like start a journal. If you, you have to get out of that negative self-talk, you have to tell yourself that you're healing. You have to tell yourself that you're getting stronger and you're getting better. You know, sometimes it's hard for people to say like, oh, I feel like I'm lying to myself. So don't say, you know, I'm healed. You could say I am healing because in your brain, that's a little bit, it's not as, a, as far of a stretch. You see what I'm saying? So Melissa, two years ago, you got diagnosed. You started your treatment protocol and eventually introduced your ozone major autohemotherapy into it. Can you describe that two year period up until the present date and any conflicts or struggles you had during your treatment protocol? Yes, I would say that one of the biggest struggles that I had was exercise. So I was getting better and I was getting stronger, but I was having this issue where I could not do any physical activity because I was so weak that I just like either couldn't get through the workout or I would get through the workout and my body would hurt so bad that I could like you know, I felt like I got hit by a bus and I couldn't do anything the next day or my muscles would be so insanely tight that I just like, oh my gosh, I can't work out. Like, this is terrible. This is how it's going to be. Like, this is not an enjoyable experience. The other thing I had an issue with was sweating. So I would say that the first year that I moved to North Carolina, it was a really hot summer and I could barely walk outside without feeling like I was going to pass out. So a lot of the times people with chronic illness or chronic Lyme, they have issues detoxifying and their body doesn't sweat enough. And sweating is the best way to detox. 
So the fact that I wasn't sweating and I would just like walk outside and I would not sweat. So my body would just heat up and I just feel like I was about to pass out. That was something that I really, really struggled with. And then I would say the the food was also a really, really, though that was a huge struggle because I could barely eat anything. I would say that on a daily basis, I was eating just ground beef because I was allergic to corn, chicken, and turkey. So all I could eat was ground beef, avocados, and like asparagus, sometimes carrot. And I mean, that got old after a while. Like I, it's like I was eating high quality, 100% grass fed beef, but like how much beef can you eat? You know what I'm saying? And for me, I went from being like a plant-based vegetarian to eating like, you know, a paleo primal diet. So that was really, really difficult for me because I've never really liked eating animals. It makes, makes me feel bad. I don't like the taste of it. But that was the one thing that really helped me heal was because I was so nutrient depleted. I needed to eat meat. I mean, it just was at that point. So Melissa, you, you use a variety of therapies to heal and recover over the past two years from herbs to yoga to the ozone therapy, infrared saunas, probiotics, and CBD oil. One thing that I think is an emerging concept out there is the use of CBD oil for pain associated with Lyme and also anxiety associated with Lyme. So can you speak to the benefits CBD oil had in your health? Oh, yeah. I can't say enough positive things about CBD oil. First of all, CBD oil helps me sleep because I know like a lot of Lyme patients, they have issues sleeping, falling asleep and staying asleep. So CBD oil helps me to actually like sleep. It also helps me with the seizures. And I call them Lyme seizures because I didn't have like the full on like grand mal seizure where, you know, it's very visible. I had these almost like, just like Lyme is an invisible illness. I'd call them like invisible seizures. So I would get the Lyme seizures and those were really, really uncomfortable because it was like, you would just get them randomly and nobody would know that you were having it, but it was just like this very uncomfortable feeling in your body. Well, the CBD oil basically like got rid of all of those. Like once I started taking CBD oil, those completely went away. I also used it to treat anxiety. Like you said, it helps to like calm you down. And I also used it to treat the epilepsy that Lyme triggered. I never had epilepsy before Lyme, but that's something that just like kind of surfaced when it came out. And CBD oil really, really helps with epilepsy. I cannot like suggest it enough. One great thing about CBD oils, it really helps reduce inflammation in the body. And most Lyme patients are struggling with inflammation on a regular basis. Exactly. I mean, there's so many things that CBD oil does. It's just like the benefits, just it, it's, it's insane. I would say that anybody that has Lyme or chronic pain or, you know, like arthritis should take CBD oil. I take it internally. I mean, like, you know, under my tongue. So I take it that way, but you, you can also rub it on your skin too. And then they have like, you know, like CBD oil pens now, like you can buy a hemp oil pen and those work great as well. Good for stress. Melissa, how are you feeling today? Today, I'm feeling pretty good. I would say that like on most days, I'm probably like 80 to 90% from what I used to be. You know, if I get enough sleep, it kind of depends on, yeah, sleep, what I'm eating. Also, a big thing for me is making sure I keep my blood sugar stabilized because when I started to get Lyme really bad, my blood sugar was awful. So I couldn't go like two to three hours without eating something. So I'd say like, as long as I make sure I'm eating and drinking enough water and getting enough exercise, then I feel pretty good. And I'd say I feel pretty good today. So Melissa, can you share with our listeners how your tick disease experience has changed you? I would say that it's made me a lot more empathetic to those struggling with mental health issues, any chronic illness or chronic pain. It just helps me to understand what's going on in someone's brain. I think like it's made me a lot more curious as to like what's going on in the body. I've always been really passionate about holistic health, but it's taken it to a new level. You know, I'm a certified nutritionist, so I've always been into it. But now now it's like, I feel like I have this extensive amount of knowledge and I want to share it with the world. And I want to share it because I was there. I was basically on my deathbed or about to go into a home where they would tell me that I was crazy. I mean, it was so bad. Like I know what people are going through and I just like, it's changed so much because I just want to get the information out there. Like this is what I did and this is what healed me and helped me. And like, you can do the same thing. 
So Melissa, you have created a wonderful, successful blog that shares your experiences with others who are suffering so they can learn from your experience. Yes, yes. So my blog is called theorganicbabe.com. And I didn't name it anything to do with Lyme because I wanted it to be like a place where people could go, like even if they didn't have Lyme, if they had like chronic pain issues or like mental health issues or anyone that just like wants to live a more holistic, chemical free life. Like, you know, I recommend using like non toxic makeup and hair products and skincare products. So I outline like my whole story on. On there and everything that I used, all of the different alternative therapies I used to heal Lyme and multiple chemical sensitivity and all of the products that I used. I wanted to create a resource for everyone to have because I felt like I couldn't, you know, I explain my story to people that I meet in person, but I mean, that's the great thing about social media is that I've been able to like share this to the world. The information needs to get out there. And if it's me, that's great. <laughs> it, just, it just needs to get out there. If someone were not sick and they were trying to avoid mm -hmm. getting sick from a tick disease, what advice would you give them? I would say to strengthen the immune system as much as possible. So that right there is going to help you out in the long term. You know, trying to eat as healthy as possible, choosing organic foods, avoiding chemicals, like I said, using non-toxic household cleaning products. Makeup is a huge thing, skincare products. And I would say that using essential oils. So they make these really great essential oil sprays now that you can spray down your body before you go outside. If, if you're going to be outside, that would help you to repel ticks. I would also say that you should check yourself. If you're outside, you should check everywhere to make sure that you don't have a tick on you. And then I would say, I mean, my recommendation is if someone got bit by a tick, then they should should just get antibiotics like immediately because I don't even think that they should just wait for the symptoms. I think that it's just better to go to the doctor and get on doxycycline and just take the antibiotics to just make sure. Melissa, we appreciate you sharing as much as you have with our listeners and we really enjoyed our time with you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Tick Boot Camp interview with guest Melissa Layback. To our listeners, we have a call to action. First, if you would like to learn more about Melissa Layback and her tick disease journey, please visit her Instagram at Melissa underscore Layback or her blog, The Organic Babe. Second, if you enjoyed this episode of the Tick Bootcamp podcast interview with Melissa Layback, please share with your friends by using the social media buttons at the bottom of the post. Third, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Google Play Music, or Spotify to get the automatic episode updates from our Tick Bootcamp podcast. And finally, please take a minute to leave us an honest review and rating on iTunes. This is a new effort on our part, and we could really use your help in creating the show you would like to listen to. We make it a point to read every single one of the reviews we get. Thank you for listening.